Um, I'd like to start with the big picture. So in your book, The Bassoon King, you talked about that as an entertainer, you think there's too much entertainment in the world. How do you create and navigate a career in an industry that has all of these extremes? So you have the extreme of being able to make something beautiful and magical and meaningful. You also have this extreme of being able to make something that's selfish and destructive. So I think that entertainment is a tricky thing because uh, entertainment can span mindless distraction to the most profound works of art that can touch your heart and change your life. And it's all lumped under this umbrella of like, you know, entertainment. I believe that people that work in show business are essentially storytellers. And then you choose what part of the stories that you want to be a part of um, and you want to help tell. I have always chosen to align myself to tell stories that are uh, in some way, shape or form uplifting or meaningful or address some kind of universal human element. But I think no matter what uh, job we're in, you know, if you're an engineer, you can, you can help engineer some really, uh, you know, terrible buildings that that make the world a worse place, you can, you can pave over wetlands, no matter what career you're in, you know, you have choices to uh, make a positive impact or a negative one. You're right, that does span a lot of careers, maybe even most careers. And so I'd like to go now to this idea of decisions and how you make decisions. Maybe you could give us an example of a decision point in your career. How did you make that decision, the process? Who did you consult? And how did you finally decide what direction to go? I started as an actor. And so as an actor, I get offered, you, you audition or you get offered roles and you choose whether to do them or not, or commercials or what have you. Um, you then, as I started develop, developing my other skills as a producer, a director, a writer, um, then I started to initiate my own um, projects. So anyone working in Hollywood has, you know, stuff coming in and then the stuff that they're initiating. So the stuff that I'm initiating, um, I hope will, will help move the conversation forward in some way, shape or form. Now that could be one of the things I'm working on right now is a, a horror science fiction movie, but it's about the dangers of biotech and CRISPR and bioengineering and, you know, a conversation that we have to be having as, as a species on the planet, you know, it's not, and no one wants entertainment that's just good for you. I mean, no one wants to like, you guys, none of you guys wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to go to YouTube and just watch something that is really, really well meaning. I just want to watch the most well meaning content possible. No, you want something entertaining. It's going to make you laugh. It's going to make you feel it's got interesting characters. It's got situations you've never seen before, whether it's a docu series or whether it's a scripted series. Um, it sometimes we, we would call it when I was, uh, working on soul pancake, you know, chocolate covered broccoli that you do, you have to, there's a message that you want to give, but you have to really dress it up with just unabashed entertainment. It's gotta be funny as hell. Um, one of the things I did recently was I did a docu travel series where I went to Greenland, uh, called an idiot's guide to climate change. And I want, I really wanted to see as an experiment, uh, and it was a six part series. We had Greta Thunberg on it. I went to the UN, I was on an, iceberg in, in, in Greenland. And I really wanted to see, can we bring comedy and humor into a discussion about climate? Um, and it was, you know, it was moderately successful. It wasn't like a big hit, but very few people go on the internet like, Oh, I want to watch it. I want to watch a show about climate change. You know, it's, it's devastating. It's terrible. It's depressing. You hear the, read the headline. You're like, Oh, I can't even read about another, like, zombie fire in Siberia releasing tons of methane into the into the atmosphere. But um, so these are some of the processes uh, at work um, to um, harness the skills that one is given toward, uh, again, 
trying to move the conversation forward in some way, shape or form. One thing I will say that just from a personal level, um, I think we have a tendency as human beings to view our capacity in a much smaller context than it actually is. I think most of us, unless you're kind of a narcissist, which I'm a little bit, but most of us think of ourselves, uh, tend to reduce ourselves and put ourselves in a much smaller place than we actually are. For instance, like, when I was first moving to Los Angeles, everyone was writing television scripts. And um, in fact, there's a very funny story. This guy Spalding Gray did an experiment and he would go uh, with a camera and he would go into a grocery store and interview someone. It's like, how's your script coming? And the person would be like, how'd you know? And then he'd go to the cashier and say, how's your script coming? They'd be like, how did you know? And then to the bag boy taking the grocery bags out to the parking lot, how's your script coming? Um, how did you know that everyone in LA is writing a script? But anyway, so I moved to LA and I started writing a script and I was just jotting down a bunch of ideas. And then one day I read the ideas. I'm like, oh, this is dumb. And it was in this notebook and I threw it in the bottom of a closet and I was like, ah, I, I'm, not good. I'm no good at this. Cut to many years later, we were moving to another home and uh, in the box, I was going through this box of storage stuff and there was that notebook and I opened it up and I looked at the ideas that I had been writing down, you know, five or six or seven years earlier. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't great, but you know what, it was, it was pretty good. There was some really good ideas in there. There was some funny concepts and characters. Something you and... could grab onto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I realized then kind of like, oh, I had just negated myself because I didn't instantly write a brilliant script right out of the gate. And I had limited myself and my, my limited self-beliefs. So I think part of the journey, part of the struggle in kind of making these choices that you're talking about to in one's career to make the world a better place is to think of ourselves is to be open to the possibility that we might be able to achieve a lot more than we are uh, originally conceive of ourselves. Sometimes and then I went, we cut ourselves short. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. And I, you know, then I went on to, 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 to found soul pancake and do writing projects and, and, and whatnot. And, and I was very lucky to have those doors uh, open for me later on. I just would like to connect to what you are saying and uh, this feeling of not being enough. No? And I'm thinking about uh, those people that are particularly at the beginning of their career. Uh, when you are young and you are just at the beginning, you are also looking for, for acceptance, right? Acceptance of, uh, of your peer. And that's, uh, that needs of acceptance may take you off, right? Off the road. And I, I just wonder if you experienced that at the beginning of your career and so, uh, how did you how did you manage not to lose sight from just speaking personally um and many actors are like this like you become an actor because you want to be liked you know it's like i want people to like me oh look i can play funny characters and make them laugh oh they seem to like me more i'm gonna do that <laughs> right it, i didn't go into acting like i want to change the world i want to illumine the human condition no it's like oh i want people to laugh and like me more so it's been a journey, you know, and so, but unfortunately, that'll only take you so far because to be a great artist, you have to move past wanting people to like you, you have to take risks and, um, and learn and grow and fail. And I know for me, like, one of the, um, one of the greatest experiences I ever had was one of my greatest failures. And that was my first opportunity to perform on Broadway. I think this was in 96. And I was I had a lead role on a Broadway play. And I was a you know pretty young actor at the time. I was so nervous about it and wanted so much to be liked and to get acceptance. I was thought, oh, I could get a New York Times review. I could get a, a Tony nomination. I could sign with the William Morris agency. Oh my God. And you could do pressure, a lot of things. <laughs> and this pressure came up so much that it, it limited me and I was terrible. I was sucked. I was awful in the play. I, I bombed. I got bad reviews. I was terrible. It was, it was an awful experience. It was excruciating every night. You have no idea how hard it is for four months to do a play, eight shows a week, to show up every night knowing you're bad in the role. And 
you can do certain things to make yourself a little better as you go, but m most of the role is determined in the rehearsal process and it's very hard to change once you're out of that rehearsal process. So it was just awful. I was in tears mm -hmm. to my wife on the phone. She was going to graduate school at the time and um, just going through, uh, going through hell. It was living hell. But when I got done with that experience, I was like, no more am I going to do that again. I'm not going to try and please everyone. I'm not going to try and be something that I'm not. And it really was a turning point. And part of it was like, I'm going to embrace who I am. I'm a naturally quirky guy. I have a unique point of view. I'm not going to try and be something else to please other people and hope, hope beyond hope for that Tony nomination or, 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 or the New York Times review or what have you. And that allowed me then later to get a role like Dwight on The Office because I was much more just in touch with myself as an actor and what I bring to the roles, me personally. So I'm so grateful looking back on one of my greatest failures, bombing on Broadway, um, for the paths that it opened up for me. And most of us, our failures aren't that public, right? <laughs> What was it that kept you from saying, I, I'm just done with this whole thing. I'm done with show business. I don't want to do this anymore. This is awful. This was a bad career choice. What kept you in the game? I truly, as I trained as an actor and trained in the theater, I truly was um, a believer in the theater itself and in storytelling. And I absolutely love the and loved the process of acting. I love the idea that you get a, a piece of paper with a bunch of words on it. You know, it says Mike and Steve colon has what they say. And you, you, you're you supposed to bring that to life as if you're Mike or you're Steve in this play. And that the mystery of that, the transcendent experience um, of trying to make language feel organic and real and have it's a mystical experience it's a spiritual experience and i was a big believer in that and i thought well i may not have any success but worst scenario i'll go somewhere and just do community theater that's fine or i'll teach an acting class somewhere so uh, i was ultimately fine with that it, it wasn't really about the um any success or accolades but it really was about the art you know when i started now i'm a total sellout but when i started i really was an artist let's see if people have questions for rain i wondered you started to kind of touch on this rain like how you conceive of mistakes at this stage in your career i mean i think right like there's there's one way of saying oh don't make mistakes avoid them there's another perspective that's like oh of course everybody makes mistakes and that's how you learn and you know like it's kind of a trite like glossing over of the pain of mistakes or the shame around mistakes but I wonder, like, given that story you just told about Broadway, like, what, how, how you think of mistakes at this stage in your life? Well, I, I feel like mistakes are part of life, and if you're not making mistakes, then you're not living. So, we all are in a process of constantly making mistakes. So, it's not really about mistakes. It's just trying to align yourself with the kind of uh, the great glorious spirit of the universe and uh, have that wind be in your sails and help that push you in the right direction. And there's, you know, there's a lot of, for me, there's a lot of spiritual tools that I draw on to help me in that. There's prayer and meditation. And there's also consultation. You know, I think that consultation is not just about like, oh, hey, we want to do this project. Let's consult about it. When you guys were sitting around a conference table, you know, or we're having an assembly meeting and we're around a table, let's think like consultation is a lifelong process. It's a way of being in the world. It's a way of harnessing the collective wisdom of your friends and family and, and kind of, uh, advisors. And so I run things by people all the time. I mean, I would just call friends. I have groups of friends and chats and I'm like, should I do this or should I do it this way? What do you think? What do you think I should be doing with my life right now? Hey, can we get on the phone and I'll just talk about what next steps I might want to take in my career? Uh, what do you think about that? So there's Are there a particular people that you call on for this when you're when you're making a decision or you're at a uh, inflection point. Well, I have a therapist 
he's very helpful. I have a wife, she's very helpful. Uh, but beyond that, yeah, I have lots of different friends. I have different groups of friends. I have friends from my faith community, professional friends, WeChat groups, um, my buddies I started Soul Pancake with. And depending on the choice I need to make, you know, I'll, I'll reach out and um, not be afraid to be in kind of active, constant consultation. I used to make all my own decisions. That never really worked out very well for me. So uh, living in consultation is a, um, is a beautiful way of, it's not just a specific tool, it's a way of being in the world. Yeah, do you feel that you can implement that in your work environment as well? The concept of consultation, we do discuss quite a lot in BBF, you know, and uh, yeah. I wonder if it, this is a tool that you use also to make a difference uh, or an impact in your workplace or if there's any other way that you feel you're personally making an impact? Um, well, a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> Yes, I think that the uh, best artistic uh, projects arise with a spirit of consultation about them, where you're hearing from everyone and kind of seeking a commonality, a grassroots kind of uh, propulsion to uh, move the project forward. I think that's very important. You talked about impact. In the entertainment business, we also want to look at address impact, like not only what the content we want to make, but what kind of impact do we want it to have? And, and now there are, because of social media and other tools, there are ways to kind of harness the storytelling into have even greater impact. And many film studios and entertainment companies are starting to develop impact uh, divisions uh, within the company to say, hey, how can we how can we allow this story to reach the intended community and have the intended effect? I just did some work with Ted, um, Ted Talks and Ted Community, and they're very involved in that as well. Um, how can what we're doing have the greatest impact? Um, we don't want to just reach the kind of intellectual elite. We want to really create tools for a mass audience. So I, as, as you were saying about embracing who we are and um, telling stories that are meaningful and pushing humanity forward, but not feeling like we have to be stifling our, our, our personality and our energy. And I, I would love your advice on this. So I've, I've been basically, I've been writing a book where I've been researching a service-driven leadership style. So much of it is telling stories of, of individuals, these like heroes that I've gotten to meet in different, different points in my life. And I've started to think how to launch it in a way where it's, it's something that's very meaningful and it's an important subject like leadership and service and diversity and i i would like to would like to share it in a way where it's taken seriously but i don't have to be a ser like a serious person because i'm actually quite joyful and hopeful so i'm trying to figure out how to infuse a lighthearted fun joyful energy in something that is also taken seriously I think that's wonderful. I think that's a, it's a, it sounds like a great topic for a book and um, a very needed one. And, um, you know, I wish you the best. And, you know, there are, there are ghost writers that you can hire to help, um, help make it more lighthearted or more fun to help, um, you know, shape and form the material. Um, and there's really no harm, no foul with that. I think that happens all the time. Have someone come on and just, you know, do polishes and rewrites and stuff like that, because you really want it to be the very best it can be so that it can impact the, the most amount of people. And how do you keep your, your energy of comedy and being so lighthearted when you're looking at, you know, girls' education in Haiti and the environment? Like, how, what, what, is, what are some of the things that you do to stay stay rain? I don't always succeed. Oftentimes I'm very sad and sometimes I'm very angry. Um, and sometimes I'm very overwhelmed. So I think that um, it's really important to just be very real with where you're at. And, um, and in so doing, then you can move, you know, I had a friend who said the only way out is through. So you can't take those emotions of fear, anxiety, negativity, depression, overwhelm, and we can't 
tap them down. <laughs> Not feeling those things. <laughs> We've all kind of witnessed that in people. You have to, you have to have those feelings. You have to feel them. And if you feel them fully and go through, this can be, you know, for me, it's part of my process and in, in my therapeutic process, then you come out on the other side and realize that joy is a tool that helps in so many ways. You know, Abdul Baha says joy gives us wings and it, it allows for greater inspiration. It allows us to reach more people. So once you can process your own stuff and come to joy, then you can uh, use that as a tool to help make the world a better place. And that's a lot of what we did at Soul Pancake. We made over 7,000 videos that have a billion video views uh, on them. And many of them were just unabashedly about joy because we felt like joy was something the world needed more of. So how do we, how do we bring joy to the world as a service? And it doesn't matter what business you're in. I think that's something that we can all do. Rain, we just wanted to ask a question with my wife about the uh, different avenues uh, or genres that uh, do you feel that comedy uh, as a movie genre is the best way to convey those uh, meaningful ideas to public? Uh, is it easier to talk about uh, serious and difficult uh, issues uh, with uh, comedy or sci-fi or drama? What is the best uh, genre for this? This is a question that's discussed in Hollywood a great deal. Um, certainly, there have been amazing dramas. I don't know if you saw Spotlight, that won the Oscar, that really did so much to... Uh, to highlight the uh, the systemic cover up of childhood abuse in the Catholic Church. After that movie, no one thinks about that issue in the same way. So it really moved the needle, right? Great performances, great story. It was told as a thriller. It was told as a journal journalistic room thriller. You know, like a like the uh, the the all the president's men. You know, in a similar in a similar vein. And so many of the great stories uh, are to better told through science fiction or horror or comedy than just directly. We think about the movie Get Out and what that did for racism, especially for young people to allow them to see, oh, this is a horror film about racism, but oh, it, it starts to peel the onion back on hundreds of years of racism kind of ingrained and especially in a certain kind of strata of white society and you know and 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 what that means it it was incredibly illuminating perhaps not specifically but metaphorically and um on a gut level incredibly helpful and i'm so glad they made get out as a horror film with some comedy elements than as a really syrupy, heavy treatise about racism that no one would have watched. Everyone's like, oh, a horror movie. Oh, cool. Jordan Peele, awesome. And that allowed it to kind of reach a mass audience and kind of sink. And it started, I really think Get Out started that conversation about Black Lives Matter even before George Floyd uh, and that stuff happened. It kind of set the table for those discussions. So. These genre uh, choices that one makes and comedy is the same way can really help with the storytelling. Um, if you're a storyteller, you have to figure out the best mode to, again, have that impact. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, hi, this is, uh, this is Mark Himmel and thanks Rain, for that. Um, and I'd like to, before I ask my question, uh, maybe even comment a little bit on, uh, on you know, the science fiction versus humor you know, to address these kind of social issues and raise them. And I think anytime you take something out of context from what is perceived normal, um, it gives you a different perspective to see things very differently. A Star Trek episode where you have a white person kissing a black person for the first time on screen takes it out of what you normally see. It puts it in a very different environment. To me, it always comes down to a question I have, which is how do we measure our impact? And Ray, you mentioned having a billion people having viewed your, your, your short videos on, um, on joy. And so that's one, you know, one clear way to kind of measure what, what the potential impact is. 
Now, following that up with a survey is, hey, did this increase your joy for the day and make you happier? You know, and getting some you know measurable result of, you know from that. But sometimes what we do seems very far away from having meaning or impact on a regular basis. And how do we? How do you kind of take a look at what you've done and say, okay, how is what I did today going to have positive impact? You know, moving forward, especially something that seems to be very far away from. I'm in a very privileged and a fortunate position to be in the industry that I am in and get to do these uh, cool projects. Um, but I will say that um, everyone can make a difference. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're working at an ice cream shop and you're giving people ice cream, if you do that with service and humility and joy and courtesy, you are helping make the world a better place. And um, I don't know that there is a world with 7 billion of us on the planet where everyone can be working in such a way where their work makes a direct impact of service on a community. I think everyone can uh, make the world a better place in how they do what they do. Um, and then there's lots of other ways to serve. There's ways to volunteer, there's ways to give time, there's ways to give 1% of your income to nonprofits that do the work that you, you love. There's way to increase your own education and the education of others. So um, I think it's a constant process. But if you are in the position where you could be serving more people and you're in a privileged position, and you could be serving more people and making the world a better place, then ethically, you have an obligation to, to do that thing. There's, there's many ways to do that. But I, I truly believe that if you have that as an option in your life, and perhaps you would, it would require you to make, God forbid, a sacrifice in your lifestyle or your comfort that this is something you should deeply, ethically consider in the process of consultation, in prayer and meditation, but also consultation with your, with your posse, you know, with your group of people that kind of have your back, that know you, that know your, your flaws, that know your hopes and dreams, and will help steer you on the right path. Some people call it the board of directors. We all have a board of directors that we appoint. And those are the, <laughs> the people that we can consult. Martina, any other questions? Yes, we have Gary. Uh, I want to thank you, Rain, uh, for every night saying good night to me. It's really quite wonderful. Um, as we know, you have a podcast and we listen to it and many of us kind of go to sleep, you know, listening to your podcast, at least if we're here in Europe. Um, I want to talk a little bit, you're an actor, and about the way that you communicate. Because I think it's sometimes it's quite difficult to communicate. There's different cultures. I mean, I've worked, and so has Heath and others in the room, have worked in different cultures around the world. And in some cases, we're dealing with rather difficult people. In other pieces, places, we're dealing with rather easy to talk to people. But the main effect I really want to talk about, I mean, as I'm a Californian, so I always say I speak like a Californian. I'm sorry, you know, that's where I was brought up. My, and, and But there are many places in the world where people will react either positively or negatively in the way that you speak, in the way that you present things. You're an actor. Is there a difference in the way you speak to somebody and what tone you use and what the way you look at them, the way that you behave with them? Are there better ways? Are there worth way, worse ways? Or you just have to kind of figure it out? I think, uh, obviously, we, we suit the way that we communicate uh, differently depending on the circumstances, right, and who we're speaking to. Um, but uh, hopefully people can um, adapt. You know, there's different cultural differences. You talk about Californians, you know, my, you know we're... Uh, it's very hard in contemporary America to kind of have a true intimate friendship with someone, but you can meet someone in a coffee shop and they'll talk about how they got sober and how they were abused as a kid. And they'll tell you their whole life story and just pour it out, you know? And I imagine to some Europeans, it'd be like, Oh boy. Oh, wow. What, what's happening here? So culturally we have different ways of communicating. Um, uh, 
but I don't know. What do you, I'll open it up to the, uh, to the, uh, board of directors here. What do you guys think? Any, any thoughts on that, on that question from Gary? It's actually what you bring up is, is actually a very good topic that we could entertain at EBBF, I think for a very long time is how do we communicate because we're uh, a, a global organization and so we do communicate with each other, but how do we do it? We, I don't think we've ever sat down and really analyzed it. So um, Rain, your, your influence on EBBF begins, right? <laughs> some reflection okay. from Emily here in the chat. Emily, would you like to contribute? Yeah, it's more of a reflection. And Rain, I really appreciate hearing you, you know, talk about moving through with emotion and, and to, to acknowledge your emotion, not to suppress it. And I think it's more of a, um, and I know you say you're not a business, you know, you're not in, in business per se, but I think in any group of you know, humans at an organization, whatever we want to frame it as. Um, I think on an individual basis, it can often be more acceptable to, you know, understand your emotion. And I think there is a lot more narrative on that. Um, at an organizational level, it's still very much a taboo thing. And I think, you know, in, in, especially in business, there is a lot of sort of masculinity traits of, you know, you can't, um, you can't show emotion and you, you know, that's, that's a weakness. Um, and I, I'm curious really how, how we can create more of that conversation and dialogue and acceptance to use that emotion to create more meaningful work. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not necessarily asking for a, an answer here, but I think it's more of a reflection of how can we create more of that in the organizations and communities that we, we work in. Um, so I appreciate what you've said, <laughs> basically. Yeah, I, I I don't have an answer on that. I've 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 never. I mean, Soul Pancake is a small production company, and we definitely had meetings where we would talk about, you know, what was going on and how people were feeling about them, and we tried to listen to people and honor their their emotions. But I, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Do other people have any thoughts on this? People that work in actual businesses. <laughs> I would argue that you also work in an actual business too, but. <laughs> yeah, and we're really talking about careers too. So it's it's the umbrella term, I suppose, of business. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here for, you know, for a second. And, um, you know, I think almost at some level, anything that we do to ultimately denies us the ability to be our true selves ultimately limits our, our potential. And so if we're in a work environment that doesn't allow us to be our true selves, you know, then, you know, that holds back, I think, holds me back personally, holds back the company. And so you know, ultimately, you know, I believe that, you know, yeah, you don't want to necessarily have outlandish, huge emotional outbursts, you know, happening, but we have to acknowledge that we are emotional beings and that we are going through, you know, trials on a, on a daily basis, especially with, you know, all the stuff with COVID and, and stuff like that. I mean, knowing that you have an employee who has had four uncles, aunts, grandparents pass away from COVID in Mexico in the last year, and in fact, some of them within a few weeks of each other, you know, that has an impact on their ability to work. And if you don't address that, allow that and, you know, basically allow some ability for them to deal with that and have the time and space to do so, you know, then they are not going to be productive and they may never come back to being productive you know, there. And so, you know, I think we, we really need to balance that. But if we don't, you know, then we're really self-limiting ourselves. Hi, I just wanted to, in connection to this communicating in different cultures, um, I was born in the States, but I've grown up here in Finland. My dad's from Nigeria. My mom's American. So I sort of have a little bit of a three culture background going, thing going on. But I work with immigrants. Um, and I think that when it comes to communication, it's very interesting that what things affect how we um, how we speak. Our education definitely, of course, the culture that we come from, the people that that we associate with, our friends, that we develop our own kinds of languages with them. And I guess that I've sort of seen, of course, as a Baha'i and, and through also this this work with immigrants that I do, that there's a, it's really good if there is a versatility in your own friend group, because then you begin to develop different ways of communicating. And, and so it, it, 
And I think it is a skill that can be learned, but I also think I've seen it so many times that that um, even without a language, you can you can communicate with people if your heart is really sort of into it. And if you can find that kind of heart to heart connection, this was to an earlier conversation that that uh, we were talking about about how how we talk that that if you're from a certain area of the world, California or Finland, that, that you just speak that one language. But I do think that, I, like I said, I see it so often in this work that that just the heart to heart language, it's a universal language. And if you can somehow hit that note, then then it doesn't really matter so much the 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 other parts of that language. Laura, would you like to go next? Yeah. Yes, thanks. So um, my question is, knowing that you worked as an actor in the entertainment industry, I can imagine uh, it was quite intense at times and, uh, and demanding. So I was wondering if you could share a moment that really challenged you and perhaps even more interesting, uh, what were some of the practices that helped you stay grounded and, and still connect to the meaning of the work that you we're doing uh, at least working in uh, yeah really high demanding um, settings. I have been through uh, countless incredibly stressful and demanding uh, situations in my work, and um, one that pops into my head is that uh, the, in 2009 I was given my first starring role in a major motion picture, and it was a movie called The Rocker. And uh, I worked really hard on it. I thought it was a really good comedy and uh, worked hard to promote it. And it bombed. And there's nothing like having your face on a poster and it's like, it's you. And then it bombs and people don't want to see it. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, it's an incredible blow to the ego and um, was... Uh, just very traumatic for me and incredibly painful. I use a lot of spiritual and psychological tools, personally speaking. So I do prayer and meditation. I do therapy. Um, I read the holy writings of my faith. I consult with people. Um, uh, I journal. Uh, I do a lot of practice to take care of myself and my physical body. And I'm, I'm not perfect at this, but some of these tools helped me move through that. And then, then the next year I went and did it again on a much smaller movie, but I was still the star. And then guess what? That movie also bombed. Um, and so you go through and you do it again, you know, and then you do a TV show and it gets canceled and rejection, and disappointment and uh, humiliation are kind of a yearly part of working in, in show business. And you don't hear that much about that side of things. So a kind of spiritual, psychological, philosophical practice is uh, what keeps me sometimes sane and, and balanced throughout uh, this experience. I see that also in your production that you emphasize a lot on how you actually put a pure intentions instead of uh, your ego to, um, in, in, in the in the in the process of, of work or in in the state of uh, flow so um, this is something I really really uh, liked uh, from also from your sharing um, and also one question I uh, what is probably one thing that you in your use time um, that probably changed you most um, on your daily routine basis for example um, that helps you to find your your career goal or your your meaningful career in the end. I was very fortunate to uh, have found something that I loved early on, and I guess the biggest decision I had to make was whether or not to devote myself to the discipline of acting. I think a lot of people think acting is like, oh, you move to move to LA and get an agent and get a TV show, but I moved to New York and did three years of graduate school and lots of workshops and training. And then uh, two years of touring in a Shakespeare company and another year of touring. And, and then four or five years of doing plays at regional theaters and another two or three years of doing plays in New York um, before I did any TV or film. So uh, 
for me, I see it as a, as a lifelong practice. And I was able to kind of, uh, make that decision to devote myself to, um, this skill and this art. Um, and it panned out for me. I was very lucky, very blessed. There's a lot of people just as talented as me from the milieu that I came from that didn't have the success and they really are just, or more talented than me. Very last question, Ingrid. I'm Ingrid and I'm here from Sweden. And um, thank you so much, Rain. It's so uplifting to hear you. And I just have one question that's maybe not completely related to career, but I've heard so much about your project on Haiti. Is there something you could share? And is it possible to somehow contribute? <laughs> It's so inspiring when you talk about it in your podcast. And I just felt, wow, I want to know more. Uh, my wife and I uh, were serving on a nonprofit called the Mona Foundation that supports mm -hmm. educational initiatives around the world. And we went to visit these schools in Haiti. And we were really struck by the incredible poverty and difficulties of the country of Haiti, but also the incredible life, humor, fun, arts, vibrancy, excitement of uh, the culture and people of Haiti, really fell in love with it. And then two months later was the earthquake. That's one of the largest mm -hmm. uh, disasters in mm -hmm. human history where two or 300,000 people died in a matter of minutes. And wow. we went back in a few weeks and volunteered our time uh, doing some arts workshops. And we really fell in love with the process of doing arts in Haiti for adolescent girls and building community with adolescent girls, um, which is one of the most uh, abused uh, populations uh, throughout the world, but especially in Haiti. And so after that, we started along with some friends, uh, Lide Haiti, which is arts and literacy education uh, for at-risk adolescent girls. We're working with currently with about 800 girls and about 11 locations. Um, we have a mobile computer lab. We do scholarships. Um, we help place girls in schools. We do tutoring. And um, uh, we also have health program and a food program. Because when you're ed trying to educate a girl who's very poor and maybe is eating one meal a day, um, you have to address a lot of different aspects of, of that girl mm -hmm. in order to educate that girl. So you can go to lidehaiti.org for more information. We certainly would love your support. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone, especially thank you to you, Rain, for taking the time to be with us today. And this has been a wonderful conversation with you. And with that, I'm going to close the session. Thank you again, Rain, for joining us. And we hope to have you back again soon. Thank you.